Juan Rulfo, best known, obviously, for Pedro Potamo. We're diving into short stories. I don't know if you guys have read any of these. Let us know what your favorite one is. But today we're talking about Tell Them Not to Kill Me in depth today. Ooh, you're killing me. Killing me, Una. Ooh. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, <laughs> this is a new to you author. I don't know how this story landed on you as new to, to Juan Rulfo. But uh, reading Pedro Potomo, I put, if you didn't know, in my top 10 books of all time, okay, possibly top five. Oh, I, I think it's wow. it's it's a more succinct, more it's kind of like, you know, like there's certain traits about William Faulkner, my favorite author that I love in terms of writing about the past, how it impacts you, the sins of your father, the way characters you learn about organically through conversation is not like spoon fed to you like a traditional narrative. They're all there. It's it's one of those things that Rulfo just loved Faulkner, but also has his own complete unique taste on things. So I don't know how much of that you're picking up on in these short stories, uh, but there, there's a lot to appreciate, I feel like, as, as we're diving into these. It's very complex, uh, and I love the relationship building. It also, I definitely felt the Faulknerness of it, um, <laughs> that moving in and out of what like first to third to second person it might have been even for a sentence and then back to first person like the narration was jumping all around and i loved it and i was actually able only because you had prepped me so much with faulkner so you know and that was tremendous in enjoying this story because it was just so good you know you start out with with you don't know the character names right A, a, a very interesting trope to me because you're getting to know their desires before you get to know their essence, if that makes sense, right? So, so you like, and I don't know how to pronounce these names. I'm, I'm gonna say Juvencio. That, that's gonna be his name for this video. But he's begging his son, "Oh, tell tell them that, <laughs> right? To tell them that." And he's like, "I can't." And he's like, "Please, they're gonna kill me." And you're like, "Oh my gosh, this we're we're in the middle of the scene. Like, there's a term for that for like when they plop you right in the middle of the scene." And and Justino's just like, "Hey, if I go back there one more time." They're going to know I'm your son, and they're going to kill me too. Who's going to take care of my family? You're right. And Juvencio is just like, providence, providence, just believe in it, right? And, and oh my gosh, it was just such an interesting plot to begin with, right? Because you're already worried like, okay, what did this guy do? Like, oh my gosh, they're going to kill him too. Is that because of corruption? Is it because he's involved in the crime? And and you just have all these questions about how can the son be guilty of the sins of the father, like right away. Yeah. So you have a relationship that is strained right off the bat. And you're thinking, why is this a strained relationship? Two, you're thrown in this very intense situation that somebody's about ready to die. It's literally life or death. The 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 setting of the stage is just so good. And you're thinking, oh, and you as you said, you have all these questions. Where do we go with this? What's gonna happen? And I, I love how it is the relationship. That is the crux of this. And as the story unfolds, you see that the our relationships are everything. And this is a perfect story of how relationships of the past affect the present and will affect the future. As Justino was like, hey, dad, like, I can't do this. I have my own kids I got to think about. And you're thinking like, he's not going to save his dad. He's not mm-hmm. going to save his dad, but he mm-hmm. has kids. So it's like, what's more important, your dad or your son? Mm-hmm. Oh, like mm-hmm. that that hits that hits human heart. That hits your emotions right here. And I don't even have kids. And I was like, I, I, I don't, I, what do I do? <laughs> well, I think you can relate to that idea too, though, of w- yep. what's important to me. Do I preserve my past or do I invest in my future? Right? Like you don't yeah. even have to take it from a generational story, but everybody's experienced that. And you, you, you have this high drama of they're going to kill me. You got to call the Colonel. Right. And then you go back to this flashback of what, well, what, ha- what actually happened with, with Don Lupe. And you're like, oh, your cows were dying from starvation. So you were breaking down Don Lupe's fence to let him feed on his pastures. And he kept warning you. And eventually he shot a cow. So you shot him, right? It's, it's these hijinks, right? Of just, of, of hilarity, of something that does happen in small towns of these, these prides, the the way that it, it, the animals deserving to, to live almost becoming an extension of your pride of what's owned to you, your providence, 
right? These, this is God's earth. Like they should be able to eat wherever they need, not just because you bought this land and you're not using that grass. You should allow them to eat there. And, and the way that these two men's egos butt up against each other of like, if you let one more cow come on, I will kill him. And then that's, that's the line in the sand, right? For, for two men to butt heads and to say, who's going to piss further into the wind, right? <laughs> Exactly. The, the when I was reading this story, I, I thought of the how they do like TikTok videos or YouTube videos or, or shorts uh, story type videos of like there's something simple and then boom it escalates and the person's like da 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 boom and then there's a fight and somebody's getting knocked out. That's how this is. It's like oh it's over cows and then there's a dude that's dead. You know it's like wow that escalated quickly. Uh, but I, I feel like that Don Lupe is pretty understanding at first. Like this isn't the first time. Like he knocks down the fence, lets his cows over there, brings his cows back, and the next morning the fence is rebuilt. He does it again. Like this happens several times. Like I feel like Don Lupe has been very patient with him, and it it, it is kind of painting. Um, uh, who Vencio? Is that you say it? I'm sorry. I I'm terrible with names. I apologize. Uh, like this guy's kind of. He is the bad guy. He's the villainous character of the story. I mean, he's kind of totally in the wrong here from a perspective of Don Lupe being patient with him to a certain point. Well, I mean, where's the story coming from? Right? Like the the fact the murder of Don Lupe is, is glossed over very quick. You know, and he's he's almost delusional, I think, at times, Juvencio. That's how I'm gonna pronounce it. And he, he's hiding in the mountains. He's scared of sounds in the night and stuff like that. Like he, his whole life, he's haunted by this decision. And at the same time, he also is, I think, somewhat delusional. And he doesn't really tell us the whole story because it's only later. Once the colonel, like we find out that the colonel is one of Don Lupe's kids who we thought was just going to let it go. And we find out this is this is sins of the father, right? This is, this is, we're going to, we're going to get revenge and such, right? Eye for an eye type situation, Old Testament style, you know what I mean? And there ain't no forgiveness. And we, we, we bring him back in and we find out that he was killed with a machete with a cattle prod shoved in his stomach. This wasn't an oops. I accidentally killed you in a scuffle, Don Lupe. This was a statement, right? For your kids and for your wife. And he hid that from you that whole narrative. He hid so much information about how, oh, th these people are my friends when really like he's taking advantage of, he's hiding, he's almost like spooked out by everything in the life that he's constantly running away to the mountains. This story is coming from a tainted point of view. It's very brutal. And I think that that brutality and that honesty and then you coming to the realization of wow, this guy's begging for his life. And he, he makes the excuse, well, yeah, I killed your dad. And he kind of glosses over how brutal it was. But then he's like, I've been on the run my whole life. And, you know, I haven't had a good life. And, you know, I've been scared the whole time looking over my shoulder for the boogeyman. That's enough. I've suffered enough. And yeah, I mean, it's that Old Testament, you know, knowledge is the, the, the colonel, Don Lupe's son. It's like, no, you took my dad's life. No matter how horrible you've had it, you at least had a life. Uh, but then it goes to the point of he kills the father to seek revenge. And now there is the son, Justino, who could kill the colonel for revenge. And then they're probably, but they both have sons, right? So it's just, it's this never ending, you know, battle that creates those family feuds for eternity. Uh, you know, and I think that the, the lesson I got from here is that when do the sons come together to forgive each other or to forgive those sins of the past, to give, forgive the sins of the father. Right. Well, and, and when is the ego stop butting up against each other? Because in the same way that like you found out it wasn't like a, we, we had a disagreement and I accidentally killed Don Lupe. No, it was, you killed him with a machete and shoved a cattle, cattle prod in him. Right. And Justino, when he finds his father, to your point about eye for an eye, he finds that he had more bullets in him than was needed, right? He was taking his revenge out. He It was a hate, aggression way of exacting revenge. And the question to your point is, is, is this now generational? Where is maybe not Justino, because I get the sense that Justino is more worried about, um, I don't think it's himself, but I think it's his family, 
but he had, what was it? Uh, eight kids with Ignace, Ignacia, was it? Which one of them is going to be mad that they don't have a grandfather? When they look around and see everyone else in town has a grandfather that comes over and spoils them rotten. Where's mine? Oh, the colonel took him out and put more bullets in him than he actually needed. And then that's, like you said, that's that cycle of violence and hate and corruption that infects a town where the only person that can get justice isn't the law, but you yourself. Yeah, exactly. So that brings up two things uh, that I that I wanted to discuss was that do you think that the colonel had some semblance of what he was doing and that he could stop it? And he sort of made it not so bad because he did let him get drunk before so he wouldn't feel the bullets tearing through his flesh and killing him. Like, I felt like he was almost trying to redeem himself, but he still wanted to enact his revenge. And then my other thing was this felt very historical that this time period that it's written is there's a lot of revolution happening and there's a lot of issue with land ownership of who owned land. You know, um, in this time period, it's kind of set. We're guessing kind of maybe the 1800s, early 1900s. Barbed wire has just kind of been invented. The idea of putting up land and uh, uh, fences on your land. It feels very almost political and historical in the same way as, as representing what people were suffering through of the owners of the haves and the have nots. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think to your first question, the the colonel... You gotta wonder. We we didn't hear from him. His his father died. We we thought he we, we thought he was fine. Like he like you know, Juvencio's like, oh, the town was chasing me. I tried to pay him off, but it didn't work. And and but oh, I'm sure the kids don't mind. Until finally, I mean, the colonel doesn't just grab him himself. He's got four horsemen. Again, the four horsemen of the apocalypse type feeling come to end Juvencio. The colonel's got process. The colonel's got got a plan. The colonel has a patience that he's been building up to that he's been planning this, I think, for years. Whole life, probably. <laughs> I think I think the alcohol, the number of shots, where it was going to take place was all planned. I think all of this was a fantasy in his head. And the only way that he was going to get catharsis for the evil of his father being murdered is to murder that man. And he had been planning this for years is kind of how I took the colonel and it didn't matter how much pleading you did it didn't matter if justino came over there and said please my father suffered enough this is what was going to happen this was the only way the colonel felt that he was going to get relief for the pain that he had suffered um and to your earlier point about like you know like the reality of the situation you know a lot of people talk about pedro parabo representing some of the you know the mexican uh, wars and stuff like that at the time it's, yep. it's not a specialty of me but i do know like when you look at some of like the the local um, what do they call them? The jefe. All right, I'm. I, I don't think I'm gonna remember it for this video. I'll look it up afterwards. But the 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 local, almost like self appointed leaders who take who rise to power through violence, through corruption. You know the the way that the story almost is narrated from the grave at the end. Uh, there there's something magical about this time. About like you said, where uh, violence is what gave rise and power to many of the local leaders. And I can't remember the term right now. And I don't know if this is a reference to a specific one or anything like that, but you can feel the DNA. You can feel the influence and the culture and how it created the world in which Juan Rufo probably lived in the modern day at the time of his writing. I guess it just comes down to the, the story, violence begets violence. And that historically we've seen that, you know, war can end war, but both sides lose. We had people die here. Both dads are dead. Both sons are suffering. And now they will resent each other as a result. And how does it end? It ends when a bigger person finally sends up and says, you know what? They were wrong, but I won't be. I'm going to make the right choice. And that's tough. That's the impossible decision. But I think that that's one that maybe, you know, there's the lesson here that that's what you would do for your family. You would become the bigger person and f leave the past in the past, learn from their mistakes and move on to something better. Well, and, and then that's the title of this. Like, that's the title. Tell them not to kill me. Who's going to be the first one to listen? 
Yep. <laughs> right. Like who, who will be that first one not to do that? So, all right. Picky, that that is, <laughs> that's our, that's our take on this story. I mean, th- there's probably a lot more to Juan Rufo that we have to discover and learn. Uh, hope, hopefully you guys enjoyed the conversation. Let us know what story we need to cover out of this connection next, because I don't know. I really like Juan Rufo. I, I, it's a honest tragedy that there's not more writing from this author because he is, really underrepresented as really just one of the greatest writers that have ever lived. So we'll leave a playlist for who hold down below. And again, my name has been Una. Thank you for spending time with us today. Peace. Peace.